satisfying way. Yep. Welcome back, and we have an amazing uh, discussion with Tim Alexander. Tim, you've got lots of news to cover, so let's roll. We've got some yeah. serious okay. issues on the uh, table. Uh, the latest out of Geneva, literally minutes old, is the talks are continuing. Uh, they are making some progress, but, uh, you know, there's no agreement yet. Uh, earlier today, crude oil went up quite a bit uh, on the fears that the talks would fail, but they haven't failed. Uh, but, you know, anything can happen yet. This is extremely I'd say, important. Because I'd say it's this, a 98% chance of, uh, of, of it succeeding. But please I, I, I think you're right, and I hope you're right. But Israel is pulling out all stops, to de- and so is Saudi Arabia, to derail this agreement. Now, what has happened, though, is a lot of, of key Zionist supporters, including those in the United States Senate, and like uh, you're from California, you're uh, one of your senators, uh, Dianne Feinstein, her and her husband, Matt, have made about half a billion dollars off the federal government. But uh, Dianne Feinstein has always been uh, someone that puts Israel's interest ahead of America, way ahead, always, consistently. And she has come out opposing additional uh, uh, sanctions on Iran. And it's not because she suddenly has decided to uh, serve the interests of her, the constituents in California who elected her, and to be a, a U.S. senator instead of an Israeli senator sitting in the U.S. Senate. Uh, it's the fact that she, is, she and many others like her have woken up to the fact that if uh, people follow Netanyahu uh, and there is a war with Iran and Syria, that uh, the six million Jews in Israel will be destroyed, as well as a whole heck of a lot of the rest of us. And it makes no sense. And uh, both the, the Russians and the Chinese have dr- uh, drawn a line in the sand, uh, really in blood. And they will not tolerate uh, a war on Iran. But uh, that doesn't seem to be stopping some of the nuts. But a lot of people, including Dianne Feinstein, have, have said that's it. And you have to remember, the Obama administration has always been an extremely heavily Zionist uh, uh, organization. It's, it, the, it was the uh, uh, from his beginnings in the uh, state senate in Illinois. Obama was always supported by the, the, the Zionist element. Yeah, but, but the thing is, they actually have two clues. I mean, between life and death, the, the Israelis and the Zion Fine say is no different than anybody else. She might be a bit of a whack job and a criminal and uh, self-serving to Israel. But the ultimate soul serving is, I don't want six and a half, seven million Jews dead. And if they do this attack, they're all going to die. I mean, there won't be a blade of grass there. As it says in the Bible, they will take seven months to pick up the radioactive bones in the Valley of Jezreel. That's what will happen. And, of course, we know eventually, even after a false peace treaty, which is coming, there will be a breakdown and there will be a nuclear war. Well, this this may be the false peace treaty, by the way. Yeah, it, well, it is. In fact, uh, John Kerry three months ago said, within nine months we'll have the treaty. I think that in 2014 we're going to have it. I'm pretty sure that that will be 2014. Obama will ratify with John Kerry, <clears throat> and the Middle East will have a massive peace treaty presided over the new pope. And, and this new pope, Francis, is the most popular pope in modern history. And uh, he's currying to every group, including atheists, agnostics, bisexuals. Uh, it's quite amazing to me. In fact, uh, you, well, the question as, you ask uh, is, as someone who's had uh, two and a half graduate years of theology, Catholic theology, I find some of his comments absolutely amazing that uh, a, a Roman Catholic priest, much less uh, a pope, would, would make them. Uh, his comments about uh, uh, all the gays in the priesthood, and he says, who am I to judge? Well, gee, golly, gee, uh, we thought maybe you were the pope, but anyway. Uh, <laughs> uh, anyway. Uh, we shall, uh, we will see how uh, events re- uh, re- play out. But, you know, he's a Jesuit, and he's very much in the uh, wing of the church that uh, is into uh, intelligence and all kind of uh, deals. He has great PR people. He hired a guy from uh, Fox News, and, you know, he's shown, and the media, by the way, the, the, you always watch what the, the mainstream media, who they support, who they give coverage to. Uh, he uh, blessed some poor guy that, that was basically missing 
uh, half of his face. And the media gave that coverage uh, a couple of days ago. And a week ago, there was some poor guy with warts all over him. It's a, a hereditary thing. And, and he kissed him on the, the, the roof of his head, you know. And, I mean, that, that's very, very good in and of itself. But he's getting great coverage for it. But there are a lot of things he's not doing, like ending celibacy and, and getting the pedophiles out of the church, et cetera, et cetera, that a lot of people who, who really care about the church say, you know, we're seeing a lot of style, but we're not seeing enough substance. Yeah, and this is classic crazy. Hollywood. This is classic PR. Right. And, and I see him right now, I think it was the 17th, which is just uh, four days ago, on Mount Precipice overlooking Bethlehem. He had a special conclave with 50 imams, 50 Catholic priests, and 50 rabbis. So he's trying to bring these, uh, his, uh, what do you call them, the Abrahamic religions together and find some kind of common ground, even if they don't have no common uh, dogma. It's just, to me, it's craziness. You can't dilute Christianity. You can't. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you 100%. Uh, but anyway, uh, now there, there's several things that, that we need to speak of. Uh, I think the most important, uh, we need to talk about uh, someone who was president when I was young, when you were young, John right. Fitzgerald Kennedy. Uh, tomorrow, in less than a day now, it will be 50 years since his assassination. Uh, the people that killed him uh, were never punished. They were never arrested. They were never tried. And uh, except for the alternative news media, they've never been identified. Yeah, they have a rush of false information out there. I'm one of the very few people that actually saw the the autopsy and the forensics reports before they were pulled from my medical school in 1976. So I actually have reviewed in many hours analyzing the Kennedy assassination and uh, the bullet that killed him was from the front. And I can tell you right now, I can tell you right now, all the other hoo-ha and flim-flam garbage that's out there wants to separate the fact that they had a meeting in North Dallas with LBJ and other functionaries like George the night Bush before, Sr. At, at Sid Richardson's mansion, yes. Right, with, with George Bush Sr. as a senior CIA operative on the Dealey Plaza, with a number of other operatives and, of course, LBJ there in attendance. And Richard Nixon. Was, and Richard Nixon and all these people were all part of the cabal tied directly to the And, uh, and Jake Hoover of the FBI. Yeah. Right, so they yeah. were they were they were already in process putting a lid on it before they even did the operation. Well, it, the it was gunner, not an assassination; it was a coup that included right. an assassination. <clears throat> right, it was and, a coup. And, That's right. and, and until. Uh, America uh, is prepared to arrest those remaining members, and that includes uh, George H.W. Bush, uh, the, uh, who was one of the, the top CIA you know, people there. Until we're uh, willing and prepared to arrest these people and bring them to trial for the, uh, for the coup and for high treason and for the assassination of the president, uh, we're not going to clean up the mess uh, well, that yeah. is America. Is and we have become an incredibly corrupt society. Right. Well, since uh, John F. Kennedy's assassination, we've had the John Warner Defense Act, we've had the Patriot Act, we've had not Oklahoma City, Ruby Ridge, 9-11. We were about to have other events. In fact, my, my prediction that as long as six, seven years ago is the next major event on American soil will be a large-style suitcase or larger nuke going off in a major sporting event. That's the next most likely, and the other likely event is a CME caused by electromagnetic pulse impulse equipment that is actually here on American soil now that will take out all or part of the country's power grid system. That's and by design. will take <clears throat> decades to fully restore. Yeah, and with the well, the thing is that I just, uh, having had this research, I just talked to John Moore this morning, he'll talk about it more tomorrow. Uh, this is something he had, he got a major debriefing that these things are in place. Now, whether they use them now or in 2016 or later, many of the things that I was told have been in place for decades. Uh, they just don't want to pull the switch. For example, uh, they're training foreign troops on American soil to take guns from Americans. They're already signing the Small Arms Defense Treaty, the uh, Pacific uh, Trade Treaty, that they want to basically hand over America. Well, to that will be a, a horrific event. Yeah, all these things are happening, and we're marching toward a peace treaty in the Middle East and a cashless biometric money, i.e. the mark. Learn from their dad. 
that. Yeah. Welcome back, and uh, we're talking to Tim Alexander about John F. Kennedy. Uh, yeah, we had a coup with a, with a secondary assassination, and we still have parties. Some of them became uh, presidents, such as George Bush Sr. We know are involved intimately in this cover-up. We know that the the FBI director was there, Lyndon Baines Johnson, who became president. Uh, Richard Nixon was there at this meeting. Uh, we know that uh, that Kennedy was doing a number of things that were really ticking off the bankers, with printing 5.5 billion. Uh, we know that they continue to spin the forensics and cause confusion out there, talking that we should continue to push the foolishness of the lone gunman with an inferior weapon that couldn't possibly target him at that distance. No, and and uh, I mean. We could talk for several hours about all the facts and detailed information that prove that Lee Harvey Oswald, one, did not kill him. I mean, actually, there's a photo of him standing in front of the book's depository as the motorcade goes by. He's got the same clothes on. He was arrested. And the guy they said he, it wasn't really him. It was somebody else that worked there. Well, there's a photograph of him further down standing out there also. There, there's countless examples like that. The point is, this was a coup. And and why was it a coup? Okay, who was involved? Well, there were quite a number of different groups involved. And that was the, the, the meeting at Sid Richardson's mansion was kind of the, the final uh, night before the coup uh, of finalization. There was Meyer Lansky's organization. Now, Meyer was uh, the Jewish head of organized crime in America. He's the only Jew that was ever kicked out of Israel. Well, that was a scam that was set up. Uh, the, the reality is uh, Meyer Lansky, uh, his first base of operation was Miami. And there was an, they were going to kill Kennedy in Miami three weeks before they killed him in Dallas. But the local police got wind that something was going down, and, uh, you know, it spooked the, the whole operation, and they went back. They went to the backup operation, which was Dallas. Jack Ruby, also known as Jack Rubenstein, was Meyer Lansky's chief political and underworld operative in the Dallas area. Jack Ruby killed the the Patsy Lee Harvey Oswald, who was a CIA agent. Uh, Jack Ruby supposedly died in prison, but shortly after he died, uh, there was a, a news article showing uh, some people leaving for Israel and getting on a 707 uh, Israeli airline jet. And one guy turned as he was going up the steps into the plane and looked right at the camera, smiled, and got in. That was Jack Ruby after he was supposedly dead and buried. Um, now, uh, okay, the, the Mossad was deeply involved. The global banking cartel was deeply involved. Kennedy had signed a, a executive directive authorizing the printing of $10 and $20 silver certificates. We were already printing $1 and $5 silver certificates at the time. That was effectively taking the power of printing away from the private bankers, mostly European, who control the federal and own the Federal Reserve System. That more than anything got him killed. The Israeli thing, he was going after Dimona, the Israeli nuclear weapons program. The uh, prime minister of Israel at the time uh, resigned basically because he said, I cannot uh, do this if you don't give me a solution, if you don't get rid of Kennedy. Uh, and, and beyond that, there was, uh, you know, the, the big independent oil people like Sid Richardson and others who, who wanted the, uh, the oil depletion allowance. Uh, organized crime beyond Alansky was upset with him because old man Kennedy was, uh, was kind of a, a mobster behind the scene, and he had made deals. And they felt that the Kennedy boys, particularly Bobby Kennedy as Attorney General, welched on the deals. But so there was a, a collection of people that wanted Kennedy dead. All of those people were evil to the max. All of those people were anti-American in their actions. Uh, all of those people, uh, that the ones that actually were Americans, engaged in high treason. They engaged in a coup against the lawful elected uh, sworn government of the United States. They engaged in murder. And they have not been prosecuted. They have not been indicted uh, to this day. Now, the U.S. House of Representatives did say uh, and acknowledge that there were multiple 
shots fired, shots fired from different directions, and consequently there had to have been a, a, a conspiracy in the assassination of President Kennedy. And the acoustic evidence is one of a long list of, of scientific physical evidence that's pretty much indisputable. Uh, and, and the overwhelming majority of American people and people around the world clearly do not believe the so-called government theory of what happened. But yet to this day, 50 years after the assassination as of tomorrow, nobody has been arrested, nobody has been indicted, nobody has been brought to justice, and that includes George Bush, who was right there in the middle of it, up to his eyeballs, George Bush Sr., up to his eyeballs in the assassination. And don't forget, they also managed to kill Robert Kennedy. They dug more bullets out of the wall than Sirhan Sirhan could possibly have fired because there were more bullets than he had held in his gun. And, of course, uh, Martin Luther King was killed to derail uh, the Kennedy bid for uh, Robert Kennedy's bid for the presidency. He was killed a month before uh, Robert Kennedy himself. And don't forget that John F. Kennedy Jr., who had told friends he was running for the Senate, the same Senate seat that Hillary Clinton ran for that year, that he was running for the Senate seat. He planned on becoming president, and he was going to get to the bottom of who, what, when, where killed his father. And they killed him. That plane, he, he was a very good pilot. It didn't just go down. And when you look at all the evidence of his plane crash, they whacked him. And by the way, dur that was during the presidential campaign when George Bush, number two, was running for president. And the weekend he, he died, George Bush disappeared from the campaign trail, and they said, well, he was taking a couple days off. A lot of people have theorized he was making his name and taking care of this, uh, JFK Jr., uh, just like his old man helped take care of JFK Sr. Yeah. We haven't brought the scum to justice, and they are ruining this country in more ways than you can possibly count. We're trillions of dollars in debt. 102 million Americans of working age, adult Americans of working age, are unemployed. Now, the lying scumbags in the government and in the mainstream media can talk about, well, we're in a recovery from a recession. I don't think so. There's maybe 315, 320 million million people counting uh, children and teenagers too young to be in the workforce. Of the workforce itself, 102 million are unemployed. That's a depression by any definition of the word. Yeah, and I don't care what the bla blasted stock market does. We're in a depression. And, and that's just one tiny tiny part of what they're doing to this country. They're destroying us. Obamacare is designed to destroy us. As you and I spoke earlier in private about how, how people are absolutely terrified to have to go in an emergency room because you may go in, you may have insurance, but... You, it could cost you thousands, tens of you, thousands of dollars you, for two or three hours of nothing. You can, you can have indigestion. It may think it's a heart attack, but you're definitely going to have a financial attack. <laughs> you got that right. Yeah. <laughs> Amazing report, uh, Tim. I'll be Pop on any week. day. Yeah, and pop in any day on our open lines, uh, especially on Monday. Monday, Tuesday, you're on for a full hour. Questions on this is too stressful. <laughs> Welcome back, and uh, Chris Harris, we have uh, major reports that are showing up on ENE News. Uh, we have some unique things that you've uh, mentioned on this program. I've brought in some what I call kind of imaginative solutions that we've both put together. Uh, what they're doing is they're pulling, as you mentioned on the break uh, before we started the show, the uh, low fruit on the tree. They've been removing the MOX or mixed reaction fuel rods, and there's quite a few of them in there. Uh, they're not getting down to the real nitty-gritty, which are the bent fuel rods, the ones that are probably melted together or twisted and can't be pulled out. Uh, they're pulling out the ones that are supposedly not damaged. And at some point, whether it's weeks or a month or two away, when they get into the real diff difficult stuff, they're going to have real big problems. And I would say a chance of a pyrophoric fire when they start yanking on these is unusually high. Uh, well, yes, you're, you're right. Uh, right now, they're going after the 
the obviously undamaged fuel. There is some obviously undamaged. Well, hey, let's put it this way. It looks like it's undamaged. You still don't know what's down inside the gap that exists between the uh, exterior of the fuel elements and the, uh, and the housing that they're in called the fuel rack. So it's presumably they're undamaged. And so far they've gotten, I think, about 22 elements out. Um, Probably not, not even that many. I'm just, uh, I'm just going after the latest uh, words that I have. I know they were, they were shooting for that many. And uh, that's, that, that's actually that's, that's some good news. That's good. What, what they're doing with it, of course, is putting in the big cask. And uh, when they finally get down to, they're going to run out of the low-lying fruit, fruit very, very soon. And when they get down to the, uh, the more sticky wickets, that is, then we're going to... People will be uh, scratching their heads and as, as to exactly how to attack or how to approach that uh, very delicate operation. And delicate by, as I've stated before, we're looking for preventing a criticality event in the spent fuel pool. Now, this week I had the uh, pleasure of talking with some of my colleagues who are in the American Nuclear Society. And... Uh, I broached a few topics with them. They say, well, what do you think the odds are on a criticality event? And every one of them are very concerned with that. You know, so right. it's not just it's, it's not just me. It's not just my my, my small team. And I'm going to say I've never I'm not a member of the American Nuclear Society, but uh, they are uh, they are and they're pretty much uh, online with everything that we've been saying for a really long time now. And that mm. is that uh, they're concerned about a criticality event. They're concerned about the seal around the reactor cavity. I said, I have point, point blank asking, what's holding up the level, the water level in the spent fuel pool? And right now, a lot of them pretty much agreeing. They kind of made a nervous laugh, and pretty much it was a whim and a prayer, and just that little bellows that's holding up the uh, entire inventory of spent fuel water. So... You know, of course, I had to go ask. What do you think? What do you think would happen if um, if they uh, if that seal broke? Also, I just wanted to hear it from uh, from from others through my my peers, and they said it'd be a really bad day because you couldn't refill that pool. And yeah, one uh, of the things so that, uh, is, uh, as we were saying, it was. And of course, I asked them about the uh, the uh, boroflex, which is the borinated rubber too. And again, a nervous laugh. They said you. That's all gone. You got to consider that gone. Also, is pretty much the consensus of everyone out there, including one of the fellows who actually goes to Fukushima. So I got some inside information on that too. So everything right, no, the that we've been I have is, all along uh, is yeah. is factual information. Right. Let me add, and, uh, did, uh, Chris, I'd like to ask you a couple of questions based on some of my research and listening to other programs like Yoishi Shimatsu, who's a journalist with a nuclear background, who's visited the uh, Fukushima site ten times. And he actually got radiation burns down there as well in one of his visits because they came to a particularly highly radioactive area. I think around reactor number one. And um, what he basically said is that from his contacts that there's a likelihood because the MOX reactor fuel uh, rods and some of these other fuel rods are not only bent but they're in an area where the uh, that whole cooling pool, which is up 60 feet and it goes up another 40 feet, that it could cause enough containment to actually transfer this from being just a critical reaction to actual nuclear explosion. Now, we're not talking about something like a storm, like a cloud that rises up over Tokyo, but one big enough to actually inject tremendous amounts of radioactive particles in the atmosphere, and also just you know throw debris for say 100 miles. So, uh, you know, we're chunks of our fuel rods and concrete and everything else. So there's a very high likelihood that not only have a pyrophoric fire, but having a, quote, small nuclear explosion occurring uh, during this so-called uh, process of trying to remove the fuel rods. Is that a p reasonable possibility? What, what's the story? Well, I've never considered a nuclear explosion as a likely outcome of this, and it's interesting. I did, I did read what... Uh, uh, the ex-head of TEPCO did say, and, and that he was uh, interested in, in that uh, concern. And uh, you know, I'm, not, I'm not a weapons expert. It, it was a good, difficult. But I, I can't, I can't possibly rule that out because uh, if, if the containment is, well, as you said, said, said there, you know, there, there's there's a possibility of that. I have a little background in nuclear physics, so I'm just going to uh, kind of speculate here. Uh, there's several ways of triggering, for example, the red mercury that the Russians developed was using polonium, 
uh, as a detonator along with what's called crytron switches. Uh, crytron switches are invented in the first nuclear explosions, which are high-speed switches, so that they'd work in a few nanoseconds. So that they would uh, trigger the explosions of C4, which they used to use to compress the plutonium, uh, if you want to call it pellets or core, to cause a nuclear explosion by compressing it and causing hypercriticality. They also have developed ways of using high-speed, uh, what's called uh, cryton type switches with supercapacitors or micro lasers to actually trigger a, com a compression or a surge in energy to cause a chain reaction. And as you said before, if you get a doubling of time six plus, you have a chain reaction that'll go hypercritical and you get a nuclear explosion. What, what I think is, and these are, by the way, the micro nukes are the size of a softball that can be tuned anywhere from 0.5 uh, uh, kilotons up to 30 to 40 kilotons. So uh, that's what they use, by the way, in the demolition of the World Trade Center Tower, these tunable uh, micronukes. Well, let me uh, discuss the, what I believe is a more, was it, well, I to say more likely, but a different kind of an event would be just a, a complete criticality of all the fuel in the spent fuel pool. And that was going to be bad enough. I mean, you don't really need to have the involvement of uh, the explosives, uh, but you can have a complete criticality in the spent fuel pool, if you can imagine the whole spent fuel pool boiling away at, at one time, uh, a dazzling display of light would be the last light you have to actually see, and um, involvement where the fuel itself gets damaged, liberating hydrogen, getting contained inside of the new building that they have, and that exploding. And that I, I almost believe that that would be close to or indistinguishable from a a nuclear explosion for for practical standpoint. I think that when uh, Mox reactor, uh, uh, the Mox reactor blew up, and they found pieces of the fuel rods from Mox reactor three, uh, some of them sixty kilometers away. That was an example of the kind of explosion we're talking about. But Mox reactor cooling pool four, if there's a large enough critical reaction and there's enough neutron flux in the area, it could trigger off criticality in the adjacent ponds in the common cooling pool in reactor number one, two, and three. And one, by the way, is, is so a lot, so much containment. When they pour water in, the highly radioactive core water goes directly into the aquifer and right out of the ocean. So there's a clear flow directly out, and there's no attempt to stop that at all. It's so radioactive, if a person goes there, within minutes they've got uh, what's called uh, CNS or, uh, you know, brain uh, nuclear effects that cause confusion, drooling, vertigo, blindness, shaking tremors, and eventually, if you stay longer, increased intracranial pressure and death. So uh, people should understand that what's going on at Fukushima is killing people like crazy, and they're covering up the dosimetry badges because they're working with the Yakuza that are bringing them in there. They are uh, basically trained on the site, so they don't know what the heck they're doing. And once they get into difficult situations that don't fit the simple training they have, they're going to have these fuel rods smack, and they're likely to cause at least a fire, which will spread a massive surge of radiation across the Pacific to America and around the world. That's coming, and I think it'll come within the next two months. Back in a moment. Yeah. So, uh, Chris, with that speculation about um, causes of criticality, I'm going to think of three or four different ways of a critical reaction happening. The first is basically the rods just being uh, compressed or smacked together when they pull the rod assemblies. Later on, the ones that they're pulling are out of the new ones that aren't bit, uh, aren't bit much. Uh, the, when they start getting ones with no boronated rubber around them, with uh, fuel rod assembly bundles bent, uh, then those, they can just get criticality from them smacking together that can cause a pyre fork fire. The next is a, what's called a hydrogen uh, triggered critical reaction where you have a hydrogen explosion from hydrogen and tritiated water. Uh, that triggers off a hydrogen-based explosion, and they had a problem with venting hydrogen before. So what they've done is, of course, they covered all of these buildings so they actually can trap hydrogen. If there's hydrogen reaction, uh, it can literally cause the mass of these fuel rods that are probably somewhat kind of stuck together, maybe melted down and twisted, and uh, cause a compression, which we think is what happened with the fuel rod assemblies in, in MOX Reactor 3. 
Uh, the third way that I think could happen is that the corium, which is deep inside the actual facility, and it could be 100 meters from now down for all we know. We don't know where it is. No one's ever done ground penetrating rate or any other technology to find out what is there or do any core sampling, like going with a little robot and then core sample to see what are the isotope patterns and where are they located. But I think that because anytime you get containment, whether it's in a building or reactor core or the, the, the place below the reactor, you increase the chances of a Kuiper critical reaction causing a nuclear explosion, a full bore nuclear explosion. So <clears throat> I think the chances are, and this I'm just going to throw a guess out here, about 90% chance of a critical fire causing them smacking the rods together in the next two months. And I'm saying two months because it's a good ballpark that they'll get over the easy stuff and then they're going to get into the difficult stuff that so won't be funny. Uh, and, and there's a probably about a, uh, <clears throat> I'd say about a 30% chance of a hydrogen-based explosion that could occur spontaneously at any time that there's hydrogen being generated and it's not being vented off quickly enough and you get actually a level critical enough to cause an explosion. And the third is, at some point we're going to get nuclear explosions. And those can just happen spontaneously with almost no warning. Uh, the only thing you might see as a warning is that the neutron flux in the evening and the sky above Fukushima will show a lot more blue streaks indicating that the neutron flux is actually ionizing nitrogen above the facility and if that neutron flux increases the amount of blue light that's coming above Fukushima, she's going to blow. Uh, tell me what you think of that. Well, I've heard the description of smacking assemblies together and I'll actually, let me just say that's kind of a misnomer because really in order to uh, in order to really promote that kind of a uh, interaction, all you need to do is get them too close together without snacking. You know, it, it really even a, a slow, a slow grind. Let's put it that way. You know, remember what you're trying to do is keep the fuel uh, farther apart than the uh, migration length of a neutron. And uh, and if you just if you put them if you smack them together, they bounce off each other. And nothing happened. Maybe that's even better than leaving then the two assemblies coming close together and staying together for any length of time. So in other words, it's even worse. It's even worse to leave them together. And in this case, you know, that, that is actually more likely to occur than just bumping them together. So, you know, it, I, just, I just wanted to clarify that one technical point. Uh, another point, too, is you, the, the borated rubber. Well, uh, as I said before, with, uh, with my colleagues, yes, everyone agrees that the Boraflex is, uh, is gone. It's, it's no longer providing the service that it would be as a neutron absorber. And also, uh, uh, I'm going to bring up one more topic that we did discuss at some length, and that is the corrosion that's occurring because of the seawater. Everyone is rather nervous about the corrosion that's happening and how much material is being lost from mainly from the zircaloid uh, tubing that houses the fuel pellets themselves. So they don't know the actual wastage of the, um, of the uh, and of course, the structural integrity. So when you go ahead and start pulling your fuel, is there going to be a loss of the pellets? Don't go right down the floor. And that, again, is, is a reducing uh, of the migration length of, uh, of the actual fuel assembly. So you can get a criticality event that way, too. So that, that kind of stuff. Now, what, what always uh, concerned me also would be the brand new fuel that hasn't been, uh, hasn't undergone any fission reaction yet, and that has a low radioactivity, but it has a high reactivity. It can become radioactive rather quickly because it uh, has a, I'm going to say, a full tank of gas that has never been, there's a lot of U-235 that has not been depleted of that. Uh, it's 4% enriched. And what would happen then, that's, that's, you see, that's the stuff that would go, I think, easiest. And uh, because it's already sitting in, in a moderator, which is water, which, will, which would thermalize any stray neutrons that come around the, uh, into the energies that the uh, U-235 would reach out and grab. Because, as you remember from your physics, too, the, the uh, faster neutrons would be moderated slow, as slow because it would uh, have a lot of collisions with uh, the hydrogen in the water. And what would happen is you, you go through what you call the resonance of the capture, the capture uh, uh, frequencies for that uh, uh, for the fuel and until the point where you will allow that neutron to be absorbed by a, it doesn't take many, you know, it wouldn't take many just to, you know, I mean, in, in, in terms of, you know, in terms of molecules, you know, uh, 
a few hundred thousand isn't a lot, you know, and then all of a sudden you start to see the count rates go up. And at that point, uh, we did talk about six doublings of, of, um, of your background from, from background counts per minute up to six doublings of that. It goes up, you had a hundred and all of a sudden, um, it would double and then double again, 400 and 800. Now you're getting closer to criticality. And if, if they should be monitoring that very closely during a whole uh, delicate operation that they're doing. Yeah, exactly. So, now. Um, so, so what, what do you think is the likelihood of different events happening? Well, it, I think okay, here's what I think they're going to do. Here's what I think is going to happen. They're going to, this is going to be a very long, drawn-out procedure. We're not going to see, all right, we're done. No, you're going to see, okay, we're stopping now because we're seeing something going on. Hopefully, this is what they're doing. They're monitoring the, the counts per minute very, very closely, and hopefully they're going to use uh, a lot of um, uh, conservative decision-making to where we're going to stop and we're going to see what's happening because... Well, I don't like what I'm seeing. That's what they have now. In reality, if they're really aggressive with the schedule, which is, seems to be the way they've been going, then then they won't be doing that, and they will probably they they can there's a good potential for a criticality event. That's that's what I'm saying. So I'm giving them what the best alternative would be to do, and that is to use extreme caution. I mean, snail pace would be fast. A glacier would be moving fast compared to what they're what they're doing. Uh, yeah, in but, other words, they're, they're moving one or two fuel rods a day, is what I heard, and they have fifteen hundred yeah. to remove. So this is not something, and they're actually getting the stuff that is really, really easy. And they know the fuel rod assemblies are not bent. Uh, so the fact is, once they get into the difficult stuff, it's going to get very chancy. It's going to end by the minute, right? Exactly. Every time, every time you say you got one of the easier ones, you know, there's still plenty left of the of the more difficult ones, and so we won't know until they reach out and grab one of the bad assemblies and watch it fall apart as to what's going to happen. I, I mean, there's going to be a lot of people gritting their teeth as well. We should, you know, and at that point. So uh, it's not a comfortable situation all around. That's uh, probably the best way I can put it. I, I understate things, but um, uh, that's uh, that's the way I see it going. I see there is a likelihood for some kind of a criticality, and how they're going to respond to that. I asked, actually asked that question if they do, and it's a and it's it's a smaller confined one. Before, I mean, you don't have a lot of time. You know, what would they do? What's the emergency procedure? And I'm going to get that information because, like I said, I do have some inside folks, and I want to know exactly what is the emergency procedure for that. And I would expect to see a lot of boron being dumped into the pool and even greater than it is now and, and such. And so, which leaves us with the other problem, too, with maintaining the spent fuel pool level due to the possible breach of the reactor cavity seal. Yeah. That's a whole other so, story. So my prediction is uh, between now and February, we're probably going to have, quote, at least one event of a massive surge of airborne radiation from Fukushima. And that'll also have sent them running and scurrying and probably discontinue the process of pulling fuel rods from this uh, reactor core cooling pool. And evacuation of the other units. Yeah, and they should be already starting to evacuate Tokyo as I speak. Uh, you've mentioned already that they started putting American troops and, and uh, military people in there and uh, logistics summer of 2012. And uh, you don't hear any about it in the news. Nothing. I'll be on hour two of Rents this evening.